All right, everybody, welcome back to The Contrarians. We have a, a fun little panel discussion again for everybody. We're kind of taking a look at what's seen as a polarizing album from a big band, this time it's Judas Priest. And the album that we're looking at is Point of Entry. So we're going to each go around and I'm going to send it over to somebody. And then you tell me if you're yay or nay for the album. And then you give me a score out of 10. We'll add up all the scores at the end and we'll have kind of like a, an average thing. So tell me what you like about it. Tell me what you don't like about it. And we'll kind of see where we're at at the end. I have a couple of stats, not like I normally do with the regular episodes, but just a few things I wanted to throw out there just so everybody had a little bit of um, an idea of where we're coming from. But I normally do this on the episodes, So I started doing this on the panel discussions. So point of entry, um, just in terms of some rankings lists, um, if you look at best ever albums, it comes in fairly low. Point of entry comes in at number 14. So just above it is, well, they count live albums and compilation albums and stuff like this, but just, just below it is Redeemer of Souls at 15 and Rock and Roll at 16. But it comes in as low as 14. Uh, number one on that list is British Steel, followed by Sad Wings of Destiny and Screaming for Vengeance at number three. Um, just a quick thing about All Music actually gave it a high score. They gave it a three and a half out of five stars. And let's see, louder, Loudwire put it at 16. Uh, and the only album above it at 17 was Demolition. And uh, Loudwire says the intent was to return to a rock feel on point of entry, but it wound up being an album that struggles to rock almost at all. The biggest saving grace here is Desert Plains, which is among their most underrated songs and truly an all time great that rides steady with vigor and can be played at different tempos without losing its impact. Heading up to the highway and hot rock and represent the other veritable cuts here while the rest, while not offensive, are unenthusiastic, especially when stacked against all 17 priest albums. So this is, they put this at second last. So both on best of her albums and Loudwire comes in pretty low. Although all music gave it a decent review. They gave it a three and a half stars. And in terms of like, Album sales, um, it did not go platinum in the States. It, it charted at number 14 in the UK. Um, and in the States, it charted at 39. So British Steel actually charted higher than it in both the UK and the States. And it went gold in the States, but not platinum. So British Steel went platinum the album before and Screaming for, for Vengeance went double platinum the album after. So um, that's just a few stats. I think what I'll do is I'll send it over to Martin first, since Martin ended our conversation last time on UFO mechanics. Uh, I'm going to send it over to you first. So take it away, Martin. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this is a good idea because I also have just a, a few other stats just to lay the groundwork anyways. So uh, came out February 6, 1981 at the height of the new wave of British heavy metal. You, you couldn't pick a, a higher uh, point in the new wave of British heavy metal than the very beginning, say, of 1981. So it's quite ironic that it's a little bit of a mellower album than British Steel was. Uh, as Marco says, it went gold, but it didn't go gold until sort of a mass certification in 1989. Uh, they recorded it in Ibiza, Spain. Uh, you know, Judas Priest, uh, you know, in the future, moving forward, has a long sort of association with, uh, with Spain. Um, but they went there and perhaps, you know, the sun and the fun caused them to, uh, to uh, sort of temper the situation and make sort of a, a lighter album than British Steel. Um, you know, it was out 10 months after British Steel. They did go on a big tour for British Steel, but they did um, they did actually take a, a pretty big break there. They had most of August off, all of September, October, November, December, and January off, and they recorded this album in October and November. Um, KK says that they had some pressure to come up with some hits. I mean, they've been going a long time. They're on CBS for a bunch of albums at this point, and they haven't really had a big hit yet. Um, importantly, British Steel wouldn't be gold yet. Uh, British Steel would go gold in, uh, what is it, 19, 1982 sometime. Um, so, so essentially, they're still, they still don't have a certification. Uh, and the other interesting you know, foible or, or wrinkle to this situation is that um, they more or less wrote a bunch of the songs uh, in, in the studio. Um, what do I think of the album? Um, 
I've I, I actually like the album a lot. I, I play it a lot. I find it uh, to be one of those records that you can go back to regularly because the songs are not over celebrated, over discussed, overplayed. Um, if, throughout the years, it's it's just like there's a lot of sort of deep album tracks, even though it's kind of a magical time in, in their career. And it's a magical time in in like the new wave of British heavy metal or, or you know, old hard rocks uh, career. Um, I remember heading out to the highway was the first single that that we heard a lot on the radio. And I think it's a pretty heavy song. I think it's this album's Breaking the Law. Uh, the heaviest song on the album is Hot Rockin', though. I would say uh, that was a UK single. I looked at the Spotify numbers. Um, you know, this album is not played very much. The average number of plays on Spotify is in the range of a half a million. But heading out to the highway has 6.2 million plays. Hot Rockin' has 2.5 million plays. Desert Plain, De- Desert Plains, 3.2 million plays. One of the funniest things about Desert, Pla- Desert Plains is that on the 2001 reissue, you get the, the live version, and it's just insanely fast compared to the original. It's so funny. It's like the cocaine and the beers are, are flowing. You know, they're all hammered, probably. I mean, this is one of the reasons Dave Hall and uh, Dave, Dave Hall and left the band, uh, you know, notwithstanding the being pushed out of Ram It Down, but the the idea that um you know th- they weren't playing well they weren't performing well we've read rob halford's book i mean he was just loaded the entire time it sounds like um but it's really funny hearing that later like s- so fast version of of desert plains uh, a lot of the rest of the album is quite pop turning circles you say yes all the way troubleshooter um are are very pop and and i kind of liked it. it it had sort of a maturity to it where they weren't just talking about heavy metal all the time, uh, which would really start to wear on the nerves moving forward. I would say um, on the heavy end, uh, I mentioned heading out to the highway and hot rock and which I, which I always liked desert plains uh, is, is a pretty good song. Solar angels, you know, desert plains and solar angels to me have that sort of energy level of, the rage and really no higher than something from British steel. They're, they're not that energetic. I mean, across this album, I just feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of chord progressions that are kind of melancholy and wistful and a little bit bluesy uh, and just kind of a little bit sad and a little bit like both of the album covers uh, for, for this album. I I often wonder, I, I might do, possibly a contrarians thing at some point, or maybe a history and five songs thing, but thinking about album covers and how they affect our appreciation appreciation of these albums i wonder what would happen if you switch the british steel album cover for the point of entry album cover what we would think of these songs um but no it's it's definitely a little lighter um than british steel i think it closes on a high note with on the run i think that's a good up-tempo oddly shuffling sort of priest song um and that's pretty much it um I don't want to go on too much, but uh, but there you go. I mean, I, I really like this album. I go to the well quite often. I actually have more patience for it than even Screaming and Defenders and Turbo and certainly Ram It Down and definitely even Painkiller, which a lot of people like. So it's it's uh, one that's really risen in my estimation. It's certainly no, no match for the 70s albums, uh, but I'm going to go with, uh, with a 7.5 on this out of 10. 7.5 awesome got your score very cool um i'm gonna throw it over to matt next since we haven't seen him for a while so take it away matt thanks marco um so i wanted to talk about the album in the context of 1981 as a whole because it's a uh, it's a very good year commercially for rock and a lot of the bands with kind of their dna and roots in the 70s released albums that year that either expanded or extended their careers. And for Judas Priest, that didn't happen, right? With this with this album at all. So it was really kind of going against trend. So you think about like, um, I, was, I was looking through just different ones, moving pictures for Rush, for, for Foreigner, Journey, Escape. Um, you got Sticks with uh, Paradise Theater, even like Jay Giles Band with Freeze Frame, right? Like that becomes their biggest thing ever, Triumph with Allied Forces, Fire of Unknown Origin for Blue Oyster Cult, uh, 
even the Moody Blues, I didn't realize they hit number one with Long Distance Voyager. So good commercial year for rock. And there, there's these really interesting albums. I don't know if it's because of some influence around with like punk and new wave. So the, the albums uh, did have sort of shorter songs than what were in some of those bands. There was an attempt at catchiness. I think there's just a lot of professionalism in a lot of those releases. There, a lot of those are seen as a little bit corporate, um, but they were very successful for those bands. And if you start listening to Point of Entry with Side One, I, and if you only listen to Side One, I think you would think that would have happened for them. I think Side One is, uh, I, I, I love it. Um, it's That's a five out of five for me. You've got two really good rockers, as Martin mentioned, with Heading Out to the Highway and Hot Rock. And, and you know, I think Heading Out to the Highway is a su- superior single to, like, you know, either, like, like uh, Breaking the Law or Living After Midnight from the previous album and definitely from better than You've Got Another Thing Coming on the next album. So seems like that would do uh, pre- pretty well and catch the year and maintain their sort of metal and rock and integrity, but with a nice commercial hooky song. The other um, songs on the, on the first side, I think are really interesting and cool. So, you know, uh, Don't Go, I really like it a lot. It, it is almost a little bit new wavy in it. It's very sparse um, in terms of instrumentation. And even the, the way uh, Rod sings it, there's, it's a little herky jerky. And he's uh, has that like, he sings a lap lap, which kind of reminds me of the cars doing the time time, you know, so it's got a little bit of a new wave kind of delivery to the phrasing on it. Um, Turning Circles, I think, is really great, too. It's very cool. It's atmospheric. I think the solo section's really moody, so kind of a different thing, but but with a commercial appeal. And then, you know, Desert Plains is a you know very well-regarded pre-song as a, as a classic song. So to me, that's a five out of five side. And if I only listened to that, you'd think, all right, they're, they're going to be building off of the success of British Steel and, and skyrocketing. And of course, that that didn't happen. And for me, the culprit is his side two. Um, so I'm, I'm not a fan of, of side two. I think it's really underwritten. Uh, I like Solar Angels and I agree with Martin on, on the run. I think that's got like a it's good, good groove. And I think the vocal on the chorus is great. Like that's a really good uh, Halford uh, chorus. Solar Angels, it, 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 it's cool. Um, it's got a, like good guitar riffs and kind of a good groove to it. The rest I can completely leave. So I don't like um, You Say Yes All the Way or Troubleshooter. If Judas Priest was kind of, you know, sometimes people say like, maybe this album was a little ahead of its time. If it's ahead of its time in these areas, it's sort of um, hinting at more like hair metal with those three songs. There's, um, it's almost like Motley Crue-ish, Poison-ish kind of, uh, of lyrics, certainly there's, there's not much there. They're not really about anything. I was even looking at the at the lyrics, like you pull out the the sheet and just there's like they take up hardly any room. There's so little, even Solar Angels, which is like about something. It has a subject matter. It's only nine lines long. So there's just not much there. And then you know, you go to like the uh Screaming for Vengeance. All the songs are about something, whether you like them or not. They're, they're, there's like about something, but I, you know, you say yes. Um, I don't, you know, it's just very cliche kind of rat lyrics or something like that. So for me, the uh, the maturity that Martin you were talking about, I think it's totally there on side one, and I think they just kind of lost their momentum. Maybe it was the setting, uh, or they're just since they're writing it all in the studio, they just ran out of ideas. But I, I think the maturity kind of ends there. And, uh, you know, overall, I would say that like both British Steel and Screaming for Vengeance are more 1981-ish albums than this one was, right? It, it, those were the ones that more fit the trend of what was going on. And so Point of Entry, I think it's out of place in the Judas Priest catalog, right? It, it, it has a dip, right? They, they're on this trajectory, it dips and then they go back up. But I think it's also out of place within the, the larger trend of what was going on with rock music commercially. Great. So what would you give it out of 10? I'd, I'd give it a seven. So to me, you know, first side, total classic, five out of five, but I put the second side at a two out of five. So we'll give it a seven as a total. Nice. Thanks, Matt. Very good. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Jamie next. 
Take it away, Jamie. Okay. I got to be honest. Um, I have not heard this. I own it on vinyl and CD, but I probably, I haven't played it in, God, like seven or eight years. Because I, going into this, I always said, I don't like this album. And it's not because it's too mellow or too poppy. I just think, I always thought the songs were really bad. Going into it, though, when I listened to it today, today I kind of forgot how the songs went. So I took some notes as I listened. Uh, first track, Headed Out to the Highway, I always loved. I love the Judas Priest hits, even off of Turbo. I like uh, Parental Guidance. I might be one ah. of the few people that like that song. <laughs> I like it. I like the video. I like the live video. <laughs> you know, it's as cheesy as it is with uh, Mullet Rob in that video. Um, so yeah, I think it's a simple, well-written song, uh, in pop sensibility makes it really, uh, sore and it's got a twin guitar part. That's really cool. But then this is kind of one of those albums where the first track rocks and then, um, don't go, not a whole lot going on in that song. Uh, it's got a driving beat and that's about it. And here's the thing with a lot of the songs that I feel on this album you really have to like what's going on in these songs the very little that's going on these on in these songs you have to like because there's nothing else to latch on to so if you don't like the simple rhythm and the vocal melody that's it you don't like the song it's kind of be it's kind of like being stuck in a room with someone alone for a long long period of time if you don't like that person you're screwed because there's nothing else to latch on to no one else to talk to so it goes into hot rocking after that. And, you know, in the 80s, I would have sung, uh, I want to go hot rocking, you know, with the top down, looking for girls. But now it just sounds corny to me. Times change. I change. People used to say swell, you know, things change. Turning circles. I'm going to be, uh, I got to be honest, the opening does not grab me. It sounds like a 14-year-old practicing guitar on the corner of his bed. Um, and Rob carries the melody, and that's about it, because the rest of the band's not doing much. You know, you look at the back, and you're like, two lead guitarists, if you went into this album not knowing much. Yeah, you know what? I've heard more complexity coming from early White Stripes songs, and there's only two people in the whole band. Now, Desert Plains, I like. All right. The drumming is really cool. Dave Holland, he's doing some interesting things on the drums. It makes you sound like you're driving really fast down this road along some Desert Plains. So, yes, that's very cool. And the bonus track on this is a live version of that. And it, it comes alive even more in the live version. But then you go to Solar Angels. Um. I got to tell you, when I was listening to this album today, that song came and went. And I was like, I think, I think another song came on, and I don't even remember how it went. I had to replay it and pay attention, make sure I pay attention. So if, if, if Desert Plains is like a memorable ride down a highway that you won't soon forget, Solar Angels is a drive to the grocery store you did a week ago that you don't really remember doing. <laughs> Um, you say yes, I say no, 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 no. Uh, bad song structure, bad lyrics. It's got a little breakdown, moody breakdown that's kind of cool, but it's not enough for me to want to revisit it. If I play this album again in another seven or eight years, that, that will be skipped uh, all the way. That's not as bad as I remember, uh, even though the chorus is a little flat. Again, there's not a lot going on in these songs. Uh, Troubleshooter sounds so juvenile to me. I, I When I listened to it today, I literally turned around. I was sitting here, and I looked at my speaker as if I was talking to the band, and I said, you're better than this. <laughs> <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> uh, on the run is not much better. Uh, and it, it, you know what? You get to this song and you kind of realize all the songs on this album is, are very mid-paced and very samey in a way. Um, so, yeah, the only interesting things at times is when uh, Rob changes octaves, you know, within a melody 
that kind of sparks my attention. But anything else, I mean, I, I just like the first song and the rest is, what do I give it out of 10? I don't know. You know, it amazes me about this band. I have my issues with Judas Priest. Every album I think is spotty. Even the classics I think are spotty. But it amazes me in my world between my ears how they can write songs that are 10 out of 10 and then just do songs that I hate that are almost a zero out of 10. It's amazing. So on this album, I got to give it a, uh, oh God, I hate to say like a two <laughs> because of the one song I like is, you know, like an eight. But I mean, it was in my, it was in my phone today. I was going to listen to it on my phone. The only song I had in my phone was track one. I had to download the rest to listen to it. So I'm going to give it a 2.7. Wow, 2.7. <laughs> Not a 2.5 or a 3, but right in the middle. Yeah. Of the <laughs> I'm always the I'm always the a-hole on these talks. <laughs> awesome. Uh, why don't we hear from Christian next? All right. Um, so... Um pretty obvious point of entry is this pretty bad misstep for Judas Priest. Um, personally, I think it deserves uh, at least a good amount of the hate that it gets. Um, I know the record company was pushing the band into a commercial direction, um, but I don't even think that was going to, even if it was a better album, uh, it was never going to help the band's sales or popularity. Um, I mean, like, like Martin said, you know, it was 1981, um, metal was heading in a huge direction. You have like, um, you know, Def Leppard, High and Dry, Motley Crue's Too Fast for Love, Diary of a Madman, Mob Rules, um, Denim and Leather, you know, all these pretty massive albums. And then um, not to mention like, you know, all the also massive albums coming out in 1980, 1982, on to 1984. Um, I think that a proper album bridge between British Steel and Screaming um, would have done Priest a huge favor. Um, and it would have cemented in, in my opinion, just untouchable streak between Sad Wings of Destiny and Defenders of the Faith. Um, now that said, I don't hate the album, um, despite you know the stylistic departure from the 70s material. Um, it's probably my um, second to least favorite Halford funded album from Judas Priest. Um, 70s material has always been my favorite era, um, but there are some pretty good songs on Point of Entry. For example, um, the opener obviously is really great. Super catchy, sing along, live staple. Um, Turning Circle, also super catchy, simple, does the job, and it's an enjoyable listen, which is kind of characteristic of the entire album. Um, uh, Desert Plains, probably most people's favorite track, either that or heading out to the highway. Um, Desert Plains is also my favorite track um, however when you have a track or two that are clearly the best on the album um, that usually means the album isn't that great to begin with um, All the Way and On The Run similar song titles, two more enjoyable tracks, I think Rob shines on this album like usual um, but especially on that second track um, that's really all I have to say about the good or at least decent tracks um, which is exactly half the album, I think, um, except Thunder Road, which is the bonus track. Um, recorded during the Ram It Down sessions, but left out. Um, I find that really weird because um, I think that song is better than almost every track off Ram It Down. Um, but uh, as for the bad tracks, um, I think Hot Rockin' is actually really promising from the beginning, but um, I just can't stand the chorus of it. Um, I know it was released as a single, but I think it had a lot more potential, as did most of these songs. Um, the rest, I don't hate that much. Um, I like Solar Angels, um, but uh, You Say Yes is probably my least favorite song. Um, a lot of people say this is Judas Priest, Judas Priest like Kiss album, which is, I think it's a pretty good analogy. Um, songs are short, mostly uninspired, almost like filler type songs, um, which is is not a jab at kiss um the songs are slow moving little complexity i think a huge disappointment from the guitar duo um there's no tyrant sinner or beyond the realms of death on the album um 
Rob Halford wrote in his book that the album is a big drop in quality. Uh, I tend to agree. Um, a lot of people hate on Tom Holland's drumming, but um, I tend to enjoy it, at least for the, the 80s material. Um, like I like Les Binks a lot, um, super unique style, but I, I couldn't imagine him uh, playing on this album. Um, in the album, we hear more backing vocals, definitely more live sound. Um, and there's clapping in some of the mix. Um, the priest had some of that in the previous two albums too. Um, production is actually, I really like the production. I think it's probably one of my favorite production, um, production. Um, but overall, I think the album is probably not over or underrated. I think it deserves the harsh critiques despite priest being my favorite band. So, um, I think I give it, a, I'll probably side with Jamie and give it a three out of 10. Wow, that's low. Yeah, very nice, Christian. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, good. No, I agree with some yeah. of the things you good said. Job. Good job. Um, a couple of low scores too. Right on. Let's throw it over to Andy. Let's see if we can raise the score up a bit or bring it down even more. We'll find out. Okay, I'm going to raise it up a little bit. Um, I enjoy Point of Entry, sort of with a 2020 hindsight kind of enjoyment. I can see where if you were a fan from day one and you were following this band into the 80s, and you saw this beginning of like a little bit of a dumbing down with British Steel, and then they really lower the, the complexity level and the tempos and everything on this album, um, I, it would be cause for distress. But with hindsight, we know that Screaming for Vengeance is right around the corner, um, Defenders of the Faith is is following on the heels of that. And, you know, there's gonna be ups and downs going forward, but we know that some of their best work is still ahead of them. So looking at it from that point of view, I think it's an enjoyable detour. Um, you know, Matt was talking about the 1981 thing. This is a great time for metal production because, you know, people weren't, dicking around with the digital reverbs yet, and you still had a natural, tough, punchy, um, you know, impactful kind of sound. You had like, you know, Blackout was 1981, and High and Dry, and Mob Rules, and what are some other ones? Killers. Um, these albums sound really good, and I think that Point of Entry sounds as good as British Steel. Um, so, and, and that's something you can't really say for anything that happens after this album, really, in the 80s. Um, so, yeah, I would say this is definitely not a top five for me by any means, but it's definitely, uh, I would say, let, just speaking generally about why it's not top five, um, just the, the calm down nature of just the overall energy, the kind of middling tempos, some really basic and, and kind of forgettable riffs. Um, I think some of the songs have really um, sort of forgettable riffs, but, but Rob kind of brings it back up because he, he really commits himself, you know? I mean, he's just got this swagger and, you know, he, he's kind of got this lusty delivery and it kind of sells a lot of these half-baked songs. Um, you know, Another demerit is just the fact that, um, yeah, as previously mentioned, some of these lyrics are just sort of like, ah, they sound like they were just tossed together at the last minute. Um, but I think the simplicity and the austerity of some of this material gives you a unique insight into a certain side of the band that you don't really get to see elsewhere. Um, I think heading up to the highway is as good of a fist pumping anthem as anything else they've done. Uh, E.g., uh, living after midnight, or um, you know, you've got another thing coming. I think this is as good or better than those. Um, hot rocking, definitely corny, definitely a little on the nose. Also, nothing really new for them. I mean, they had rock forever and delivering the goods and songs about rocking before on albums that everybody loves. So, you know, th this was the kind of thing that bands sang about back then. <laughs> it is a little goofy. Um, 
Desert Plains is really interesting because it's this enduring staple and yet it doesn't do very much. Like it's sort of this really basic riff. Halford's vocal is really restrained, um, but there's a subtlety in there and it does, Martin, going back to your thing about the album cover, it really does connect with the album cover in this kind of clean, austere quality um it's evocative of something i don't know it's it's very strange um i think the lead guitar playing is underrated on this record also very restrained um kind of billy gibbons ish at times really bluesy really tasty not a lot of fireworks but it shows again it shows a side of these guitar players that you definitely don't hear on painkiller when they're like suddenly trying to catch up with paul gilbert and ingbe malmsteen um, I don't buy that nearly as much as, as this guitar playing. I think they're much more effective when they're, they're playing sort of a little bit closer to their wheelhouse. Um, I think Solar Angels is killer. I think it sounds like a Screaming for Vengeance track. It's kind of futuristic and uh, spacious and kind of, it, it sounds very metallic. I'd say that's one of the heavier... Um, tunes off this record other songs on here are sort of almost rolling stones ish uh, so i i would say just it's an interesting detour to kind of explore i do like the sound of it i think there's like it you know none of it sounds like a huge betrayal i mean they haven't like poisoned their sound with keyboards or guitar synths or anything um so for me it's sort of like i'm happy with it being there um, but it is it is funny that they they kind of put forward this relatively subdued effort in this banner year for heavy metal when everybody else was really putting their best foot forward. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give this a six point five. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Thanks, Andy. So we got Peter left. Take it away, Peter. Well, thank you. Well, I like this album as well. Um, I always have. And I, when I think of talking about an album that I grew up with, I got it the day it was released. I remember the day I got it. There are three stages that I look at. There's the immediate, the gradual, and then there's the reflective. So when I first heard it, I've liked it. I loved it. Actually, I've played it all the way through. I didn't skip tracks. I enjoyed the songs that were on it. Were they not as heavy? My favorite album is Stained Class, followed by Hellbent. Are they that? No, they're not. But as Andy said, they didn't jump ship so far that I don't know who's piloting this thing, <laughs> that it, it's not going to hit an iceberg or it's just not going to implode all of a sudden. Um, it is that change of pace. And I think with reflection, we remember that even – Albums like Hellbent and even British Steel, and then even the albums that followed, Vengeance, Defenders, there are some, what people would say, filler tracks. There are some non-mega hits, ones that showed up at their live sets all the time. The question then becomes, where do they rank with the other fillers that are in the other albums? British Steel stands up for its longevity, not only because of the hits, but because of the more obscure tracks, if you will, for the average listener. It's got a rapid fire. It's got a stealer. It's got the rage, other things that break things up. that are still heavy enough and they sound priest-like and they work. This album, those don't work so much. And like Matt said, this is really a tale of, of two cities. I love side one all the way through. I think turning circles is probably the most underrated song on that first side. It's got such a kind of an ethereal kind of strange feel to it. It's just really good to listen to. And it sounds really different than the straightforward in your face opener that's heading out to the highway. The problem I have with don't go is that drummer Dave Holland spends so much time playing the broken halftime that by the time you get to the chorus and he starts to play uh, backbeats throughout the whole thing, you're like, oh, okay, now it's got some energy. Now it kind of picks up. And once it gets to the solo section, 
where he thunders right straight through it. If they had done the whole song, even if just one verse with the broken drum, bring it in, let it run all the way out. It would have been a much heavier song. And I think it would have, would have grabbed people a lot better, but every time it broke back down, it's like, Oh, I fell down two steps. I'm still <laughs> going to start climbing again. I think the issue with some of the songs on here is that we got to remember this is 81. So they've got videos now. The videos to these songs were horrible. They're awful. They're cheesy. They're embarrassing. They're just no fun to watch. And when you get a visual in your head about a certain song, hot rocking, you know, if you've seen the video, it says it all. It's just, you try and purge it from your mind every time you're listening to it because it's just undermines the song in such a way that it makes it hard to appreciate it. You know, you've all talked about all the albums that came out at, at, around that same time. And that's what I call the gradual or the during phase. All of a sudden this comes out and that comes out. Is it holding your attention? Not really. Oh, now I move to the new one. Do I go back? No, maybe not. And then, then you get the reflective. Here comes the, the string of albums. Here comes Screaming. Here comes Defenders. But they hit another dip. There's that big crash again. Now I'll be the contrarian here just for the sake of saying, I love Ram It Down. Absolutely love it. It's in my top five. I think it's an amazing record, but there's still a dip in there. And then they come back up and it depends how much you like painkiller versus the early things and so on. The things that I also like about this is that I think because of the increased budget that they got from the touring with, with British Steel, I think this is that era's sound. It's there. There's a slightly bigger sound that happens on Vengeance, but it, it's not a big a, as big a jump as it is from the earlier uh, records to where they are here. This is the Almond Priest sound. It's big. It's huge. The drums are a little dry, but that was of the era. It's all about guitar, and I love the sound of it. And it's just a change of songwriting an approach that I think makes the vengeance and the defenders step up the way it does. Um, let's also talk about the cover for a second. Obviously both versions are really nothing to write home about, but we do get lucky because the 3d logo shows up on the alternate version, which carries over through turbo, which I think is cool as heck. I love that logo. And so there's that as well. I have a couple quick stats here because one of the things I also really take into account is how these songs translate live. Does a band like the songs enough to even play them in their live sets? This is rough. There may be a song or two off, so people don't kill me in the comments. But of the five songs that they've played off this album, five of them were never played at all. Not one time. Troubleshooter was played only 10 times. This is throughout their entire history not just on that tour, Solar Angels, 38, Hot Rockin', 82, Desert Plains, 320, and heading out to the highway, 371. You can spread that out over tours. So there's a history of heading out to the highway and or Desert Plains, coming back into the set, dropping, coming back into the set, dropping. So I think it speaks to the longevity of those songs, at least from a live approach. Um, and the other ones were good at the tour. I saw them during these tours and those songs translated perfectly live. I thought they really sounded great. They fit in with the rest of the material. It fits in with the living after midnight. So you don't have to be old to be wise is those kind of things that were being played in 80 slash 81. So out of 10, I'm going to get a 7.8 out of 10. Interesting. Lots of um, not so solid 0.5s, but like I got a 0 0.7, a 0.8. I want to mention two comments. So I actually got two messages from two of the folks that were supposed to be here, but they couldn't come. Uh, so I want to say what they said, and then I'll give mine and I'll kind of wrap it up after that. So Joe, who couldn't make it, said point of entry, 9 out of 10. I believe oh. it's better than British Steel and Screaming. Turbo would be great episode because that album sucks. <laughs> um, Todd who couldn't make it says point of entry grows on me with each listen. My favorite tracks are in the middle turning circles, desert plains and solar angels. Those songs are kind of sophisticated. So I can see how heavy metal fans might not like them. My rating for the album is eight out of 10. So two of the folks that can uh, make it rated it 
the highest. Should I add those to the total or? Sure. Throw okay, so we got a nine and an eight of two folks that couldn't make it. Um, I actually quite agree with most of what some of the folks said tonight. Um, I disagree with a couple of little things. I would give it probably a 6.5 and I'm going to type that in right now. So um, my notes are, I don't think it's a bad album. I think it's I'd like, I wouldn't say it's a fail. So I wouldn't give it something as low as like a two or three or four. So I'd give it something above a five. There are some songs I really like off of it. Um, I probably like the first track a lot. I do totally agree with Matt. I think the first side is much better than the second side, but more what I think is the album is really strong, especially in the middle. Folks have already mentioned Turning Circles, Desert Plains, Solar Angels. I think that's where the album really hits its strides, and I think it falters near the end. I do think You Say Yes is the worst song off the album. It's the only song off the album I, I really dislike and do not want to listen to. All the other songs... Like even Hot Rockin', which sounds to me like he's saying Hot Pockets, um, like it sounds like it's a Pizza Pocket commercial. Even that one's not as bad. I do totally agree with the, it sounds a little pre-hair metal almost. Some of the songs sound almost a little rat to me. So almost like a pre kind of dirty hair metal type of thing going on with the album, which I kind of like. I don't mind that. I agree with Christian. Some of the stuff reminds me of Kiss a little bit. I'd say probably the song that reminded me of Kiss the most was All the Way. Uh, there's even like a little Paul Stanley vocal move in there. And even the solo is a little simple, like a uh, like an ace solo. Um, I disagree with Jamie and the guitar solo thing and that I do hear the, the dueling guitar solos. And I think I have a note here. Uh, you can hear it on um, Desert Plains in the solo. You can hear it. Um, for sure, in a couple of the other tracks, I heard kind of like the dual soloing kind of thing going on. But I agree with Martin, too, that the solos, like, for example, on Solar Angels is a little more bluesy, you know. So it's there. I do think there's some heavy stuff on here. I like turning uh, circles. I think even though the chords on that are simple, I find them to be cool. They're simple, but they're cool. So overall, like I, I kind of like the, uh, the album quite a bit. I do kind of think it falters near the end, like I said. On the run, like if you listen to that, I think more so than maybe like glam metal, like like Matt said, poison. I, did you say poison? Yeah, more more so than poison. I think it's a little more like um, roadhouse type of rock that you would see at like a bar, like a roadhouse type of thing, and you can hear that on the final track on the run. And there's some cool vocals on that. I like the, the track, like it's kind of a forgettable tune, but when you listen to the guitar playing, it does kind of sound like they're having a little bit of fun and you can kind of picture them on stage. Like they are kind of like a roadhouse type of band. So in my opinion, I don't think it's a bad record. I like all the songs except that one song that I mentioned. Um, and I just think overall it's, it's a good album. I don't think it's a fail. So I would give it a six. I think I said everything else. It, it is, I do agree. It is kind of more mid tempo most of the way through, but I, I, I like a lot of the songs on this. It was only the one song I didn't like. And if you, and I listened to it on Spotify. So on Spotify, there's a couple extra tracks. So there's Thunder Road, apparently from the Ram It Down sessions and Desert Plains Live. So you get a couple extra tracks if you listen to it on Spotify, which is what I did. If you go from Sad Wings to, um, point of entry it almost sounds like the band regressed a little bit rather than oh. progressed well there's no question they regressed between sad wings and point of entry i mean there's there is like a gradual regression and and some would say that's not bad they kind of whittled things down at the beginning of the 80s a lot of bands did that there was this ac dcification yeah. of a lot of these bands where they got rid of all that they sanded off all the gnarly you know, complicated bits and the longer arrangements and the, you know, dare I say, proggy bits and just whittled it down to this like super effective, you know, austere thing. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, that process was already underway, you know, I mean, they were way more complicated in the seventies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. When it's weird, eh? Like when you listen to this album, it, it feels a little um, newer than it is older. Like it doesn't feel like it's 81. It almost feels like it's like an 84, 85, 86 type of thing when you compare it to stuff. Cause you can, I can hear like the stuff like rap in there. It's almost yeah. like it was if rap was an influence on it or something like, or docking, like early docking. You know what I mean? 
But uh, I just want to mention a, a couple quick things. So, so yeah, it, it's it. funny. I, I love this idea of, uh, you know, a few people have brought up the idea of Rob Halford kind of rescuing these songs and selling these songs. Is this a little bit like a vocals album? Can we reframe it as an album where the vocalist is a big deal? The way like Getty Lee talks about Rush Presto, for example, right? This is a singer's album. Is this a singer's album because the guitarists kind of step back a little bit? That's one thing. And I, I want to ask, is Reckless the last song on Turbo? Do you guys know? Maybe. I think it's reckless. Anyways, On the Run always struck me as the strong close to this album, the way that Turbo strongly closes. I think it's reckless, which I really love. I love the all last fired up. Album. Reckless is second to last. Reckless all is fired up. Is that no, like no, a, all fired up? No, no, not all fired up. Uh, a bonus track? All I think up? so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Reckless is the last. Reckless. Yeah. So, so reckless actually sounds like on the run to me. It's got the same kind of soul, and and again, it's got that that roadhouse blues sound uh, sound to it, right? And it's a bit of a shuffle. I mean, reckless isn't a shuffle. So it but... sounds like Jeff Healy. Yeah, a little bit. On the run does uh, not reckless, but uh, on the run does maybe. <laughs> but uh, uh, what else did I want to say? Um, I, oh yeah, just just on the production end of it, to me, to me, this record, you guys accurately line this up. And Andy, you you made a really good point. All the bells and whistles come out on the next album moving forward, and there's different bells and whistles every time. But this is the last one with no bells and whistles. So this one is the one that sounds it sounds a lot like British Steel, not a bit a lot different. It's funny when you guys talk about big versus small sound. I mean, to me, this always had a very mid-rangey sound that was not very big, but it depended on where you set your volume levels and maybe played with your bass a little. To me, it's it's that uh, incestuous nature between the guitars, the drums, and the bass. Everything's working together in concert in that mid-range uh, place. Uh, and, and that's if I why... Could, mm -hmm. If yeah, I could say something, if I would yeah. agree, it's, if you compare that to, say something from a, even earlier, Not Fragile by Bachman Turner, that's low. It's got a bottom end. You can right. feel the bass. These Priest albums don't have that. I think that's what yeah. you're trying to say. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. Yeah, it's, Tom Allen it was never about that until he yeah. discovered the funny funny drum things he could do later. And and I, I prefer this production greatly to Screaming and Defenders. Uh, my, my favorite going back would be probably Hellbent for Leather. And then we get the arcane thinness of Stained Class and Sin After Sin. And Sad Wings of Destiny is a very correct sounding album, but it's kind of humorless of the production. And so is Rock and Rolla. Rock and Rolla sounds fine for 1974 and no budget. It sounds perfect. No problem at all. And Sad Wings sounds fine as well. But um, but but I I do like I do like that this is literally son of British Steel and it and it's the more laid back British Steel and it's the more rock and rollsy stonesy right as as you said Andy right yeah. and southern rocking almost a little bit um, yeah. version of British Steel it it's it's the let your hair down and and it's the mainstream as as KK said you know the label kind of pressured us to write some hit songs and that's kind of what they went for. Yeah. Awesome. If sorry. I could, sorry, go ahead. If I could suggest this, what would your thoughts be had British Steel and Point of Entry been re reversed in release date? If British Steel had come after Point of Entry and Point of Entry followed the last studio, would have been what? Hellbent, right? After Unleashed in the East? Well, po po Point of Entry to Screaming wouldn't have been a surprise, but it would have been a massive shock from going from Hellbent to Point of Entry. That would have been a crazy shock. I mean, it, it already was a shock going to British Steel. We hated right. British Steel as Absolutely. Kids. We were that's, so that's, ticked that's, off. That's my British point. British Steel came out, yeah. I mean, British Steel was was the Kiss album. Uh, it, just like this is the Kiss album, right? This is the Kiss album of the 80s, and British Steel is the Kiss album of the... I don't know, maybe, maybe creatures and, and sort of the spirit of the seventies or whatever. Right. But, but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really like British steel was very, very annoying to us as kids when it came out, when we heard living after midnight, we were shocked. Right. Yep. That was, that was horrible to hear that, uh, that happened after, after loving to death, hell bent for leather and loving to death, even more the UK version, the killing machine version with the red instead of the orange and, and missing green metal issue, right?
Well, I think the thing that kept us from jumping ship, Martin, is that because on British Steel, I go back to the tracks, Rapid Fire, Steeler, some of the other ones that were heavier that yeah. could tie in to what was going on at Hellbent. So we're like, okay, well, they, they didn't completely implode. Yeah. You know, and if they had gone to the tracks that were on point of entry afterwards, we really may have jumped ship. Yeah. But it's funny, Peter, because on I remember as a kid, I remember distinctly in 1980 when British Steel came out, it wasn't so much rapid fire and steeler for us, but it was the immediacy and the total between the eyes heaviness of metal gods and grinder. It was those two. Those Those two. It, It was like every everything that they were trying to sell us on about songwriting was enveloped in those two tracks. And, and those those two tracks were the only two that we said, OK, this is better than Hellbent. It's better because of songwriting, but everything right. else was not better be, because of songwriting. So it was really it really was about metal gods and grinder. I would agree with that. I came in at Defenders. That was my point of entry. Defenders of the Faith. And that was a pretty heavy album, except for the the production was. You know, I, I didn't hate it at the time, but later now, now I just find it so abysmal. I can barely listen to it. I, I would love to hear them talk about that. Like they talk about Black Sabbath Born Again and just go in and redo the whole thing properly because that, that one really just gets so bad. But, but it is, it is a good heavy album for sure. Very cool. All right. So our, our average rating is 6.44444 whatever till infinity that's fair that's fair that, that's right pretty, <laughs> right in the middle right yeah, in the middle I'll take it absolutely very cool so awesome thanks everybody for showing up um this was a really cool discussion we're hopefully gonna do some more of this stuff in the future uh if anybody out there wants to join us in these chats just join us over at uh patreon um we have a link in the description we also have a link for t-shirts we also have a ko-fi account if you want to donate there and you don't want to subscribe on a monthly basis um and if you just want to like and subscribe our channel that would be awesome too so we appreciate everybody for checking us out and taking the time to, to spend with us and do you agree or disagree awesome there's point of entry right there um do you agree or disagree are you yay or nay on the album would you give it out of 10 post below and uh we'll see where we stack up with everybody's views at home so thanks everybody we'll see you next time all right thank you very much see you guys